Fans, we are back live with another edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Pro Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jack Kilby, Executive Vice President of Great North Wrestling, and we're very pleased tonight to have on the show a man who is uh, an ECW original WWE superstar, former cruiserweight champion, tag team champion, many honors, has had a absolutely fascinating career we're going to get to some of that tonight and i would be talking about mr little guido or nunzio wwe james welcome to the show how are you tonight sir thank you for having me doing good doing good how are you guys doing we're doing well i will now throw to the man whose show this is mr cheap heat himself morris shorthall to begin our discussion today morris I would be remiss if I didn't welcome you again to your own show, sir. That's absolutely great. And James, thanks for sticking with me for this week after our technical problems last week. Really appreciate it. I always like talking to someone I grew up watching on TV and I loved watching you on TV. And I've had the pleasure of seeing you live a few times in Ireland as well. So first yeah. things first, I'll cut to what's topic of what we talked about last week. Um, John Cena announcing he's going to do one more run in 2025. I'm just wondering if you have any experiences with john inside and outside the ring you'd like to share with the people uh yeah well i started i, I believe i start well I, I started uh wwe in 2002 at that time uh john was the, the, in ohio valley and stuff uh i don't think he was uh, on tv yet because i think he had to come to a lot of the house shows and stuff like that and that's how we got into that rapping thing too uh, I believe, because I've been on the bus many times, and he would put in the back of the bus to, again, you know, against all the guys in the back, you know, in a, in a fun, playful way. And uh, then it, uh, you know, then it caught on. So um, so I know John for a long time, from the beginning of when he started. And by the time that I got released in 2008, he was uh, up and running, you know, you know, into his push and becoming who, who he's about to be at that time. You know, he's doing the rapper thing, and, you know, he's way advanced, of course, now, and you know, it was years ago, but by the time I was leaving, he was up and moving, and he was always good to me. He never changed. I know him before, you know, and then up until even 2008 is what I'm talking about. I haven't seen him in years, but, you know, he, you know, always seemed like he was a gentleman, you know, then, and then uh, all through the years that I worked with him, and I had uh, some ring time with him because I did a lot of stuff with the FBI. He did a couple of pay-per-views with us, with, with Rhino, because uh, Benoit was in the match. So I had some in-ring things with him, too. So, uh, but no, he was always, uh, always a gentleman. I think most people are going to say that, you know, I mean, you know, most people, you know, of course he had his heat at times at the movie things and all that. That's, that's way above my, my pay scale. Um, but my experience is that what you're asking was always very good. Always very good. He was always, uh, you know, a good guy and, you know, I wish him luck, which is doing well. I mean, probably never talk to him again. You never know. James, uh, a lot of the, uh, context, the the fans ask about in terms of a, a person like yourself who's had you know such a, a successful uh, iconic career in many ways a, a lot of the fans like to hear about how you first came to to become involved in pro wrestling how you made that decision and also i noted that you trained under you know the great shooter billy robinson and, and just wanted to get your um recollections of of that experience yeah the billy robinson thing came in way uh, you know a few years into my career right that uh, he had nothing to do with me breaking into the wrestling business uh he came the three years later into my, my and and helped me with uwfi and that's when i draw that japan stuff uh that was him training me for that style but um i i was always a long fan i've had this uh, i feel you know most of this is what most of us do we talk about our careers you know i've said it um, but I was always a lifelong fan. My father used to bring me to the garden and all the places to watch wrestling. And ever since I was 10, 11 years old, he was watching on Channel 9. And, uh, of course, I used to stay up late at 12 o'clock, let them think I'm sleeping, but I would watch wrestling. And it was also that was on uh, Saturday nights. And then uh, Saturday afternoons also at 11 o'clock um, or at midnight. I think it was on midnight. So I'm sorry. And um, I always wanted to be a wrestler. I always told my parents I was going to be a wrestler, not actually knowing that was really ever going to happen. You know, and then uh, I, then I always wrestled in high school. I was captain of my wrestling team, and we used to always have to go to summer camp and uh, for amateur wrestling. It was up in Stroudsburg. It had nothing to do with pro wrestling or anything. I was um, 
you know, I was in high school. I was still in high school. I was uh, wrestling for my school, and the coaches would make us all go to the camp for the summer. And I went up there, and uh, all the guys from my Nanuet knew that I was a wrestling fan, all especially by then. Now we're into my senior year. They know me for 10 years, 12 years. I was always the, the guy into wrestling, you know. So um, they came up to me, and they said, oh, there's some pro wrestler. They say he's a coach. He's on the third floor. He wasn't on my floor. So I'm like, who? You know, and then they said, oh, the executioner. Now, at that time, I was under the smart mark, and at that time, there was no sheets. So when you say the word executioner, yes, I grew up watching the executioner. But at that time, I didn't know there was a thousand of them. They could use anybody under the hood. When I heard the word execution, I'm thinking of the only one I've ever seen. Grow up at the, I was only 18 years old there anyway, 17. The same execution that WWE used a million guys to do, but I didn't know that at the time. So I went up there. The person that was, and he was, he did work for Vince through the years and stuff like that, was Jerry Fazio. And, um, you know, I was like, oh, I love wrestling. And he's like, all right, well, he just opened a school at the time with Rocky Jones and Gino Caruso up in Parsippany, New Jersey. I lived in New York. Um, so he gave me a, a phone number to the school. And he told me to meet him up there, uh, you know, next week and stuff. Uh, I met him and Gino and Kodiak Bear and Rocky Jones and, and all those guys. And uh, I signed up and uh, they asked if I wanted to, you know, if I think I could do it and stuff. And I said, yes, and, you know. They had me come back the following week, and I started training. So that's how I started training with them. That's how I started professional wrestling. So it was basically Gino Caruso, Cody Bear, Jerry Fazio, uh, Rocky Jones, that 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 crew. And and where did uh, Billy Robinson come into the, the the picture, or how did he come into the picture? He came into picture because I, I was wrestling up for, for Gino Caruso at doing school. And Gino and Kodiak Bear and all those guys were starting getting me booked on, like, shows for uh, G, uh, uh, Mario Savoldi, who was on TV at the time on Sports Channel, IWCCW. And uh, I was doing a lot of independence for these guys, Tommy D. So I was working a lot of shows. That's where I got a chance to meet Taz. I got to meet, you know, you know Tommy Dreamer, you know, through the years. So, um, so I was doing those those shows. For a couple of years, and uh, one time, uh, Gino Caruso's wrestling school got a phone call, and there was tryouts in Nashville, Tennessee, for shoot wrestling. Now, by now, it's like 1994, 1995. So, a couple of guys came to me they, because they knew I wrestled all through high school. Those cats my team, they're like, "Oh, they have this shoot wrestling." So I'm like, "What is shoot wrestling?" You know. So uh, it was at the time. It was like 1995. It was just on pay per view. And I watched a little bit of it because we got it on videotape and it was actually Gene Leidick and a couple of those guys. And I found out about it. And this other guy from my school was going, Tommy Cairo. So, um, so Iron already, Man. remember Tommy Cairo? So he already went. So, um, me, so they asked what I want to do. So they got me in touch with, with this guy named Sinji and Kathy at the time, this lady, she was running the, the, the Nashville office. And they said, Hey, would you like to come up here and uh, try out, and, you know, see if you want to, Work for the UWFI, you know, do you not you know wrestle this? They didn't mention nothing about submissions or anything like that. None of that shit. I never knew about any of that at that time. Uh, I knew how to wrestle, but in, in our job was not to go more than 45 degree angles to break, point a break. I didn't know what I was stepping into, at, you know, at first. I thought it was just wrestling at first. So I went up there for the tryout and um, I wrestled the. Uh, you know, Billy Scott, Gene Leidick, it was me and a bunch of guys. And we had this whole camp for a week. And they just beat the hell out of us the whole time. And they were great wrestlers, too. So, yeah, without me knowing the chokes and arm bars, I didn't say, I didn't, none, none of us stood a chance. None of us stood a chance because I never choked anybody. I never had arm bars put on. I never knew. I didn't really understand what that was. And we were tapping out. So we did that for about a week. And then, um, uh, then they decided they sent everybody home, and uh, I was one of the guys. One of the, like I think I think I was the only one that was actually called to come back for another tryout, and I did that. And I'll make a long story short. I went back for that, and they beat on me for a few more weeks without teaching me, and I was you know trying out, but they were just killing me. And it got to a point where I was like, listen, if you guys ain't gonna teach me, just beat me up every day because it's not it's not working for me here. You know, uh, they were paying me too at the time, but. And then they finally started training me and teaching me and taking me in and, and teaching me the submissions and stuff. And from there, they gave me, they wait, they trained me enough when they thought I was good enough to go to Japan. And I got my first opportunity to go to Japan with UWFI. And I stayed there for like a year, year and a half until it closed, whenever it was. I always give dates 
and then they never match up. I mean, it's, a lot of this stuff I'm talking about, you know, if you, it's crazy. It's over 30 years ago, my whole career, as far as my career. That was back in the 94s, 95s, we're in 2020. So when I go through and talk about the Savoldis, some of those years or not, they might be a little off, but it's all there. It's all there. First uh, fan question, and we've got some that have come in on social media, but we've got a live one here from Grandma Daisy, who's asking, uh, which we'll touch about uh, about this iconic team. Do you keep in touch with Chuck Palumbo? Uh, I did actually talk to Chuck. Uh, I'm going to be in touch with Chuck. We're, we're together. Oh, wait, we're not together. Him and Stan Bowley, and I'm with another group. We've got that uh, uh, convention of Charlotte to get, uh, coming up. Um, so I will see him then. Uh, Chuck is a uh, police officer now in uh, Vegas. So uh, he kind of, we, we actually got a couple of shows together, and, you know, he's supposed to make a couple of me and Johnny, but it was just too much with his schedule. And that's great for him. That's his job. That's his career. We'll have those now. So um, so I did speak to him on the phone probably about a year and a half ago, something like that. But, no, I don't keep in touch with him uh, as much as I would like to, but I am looking forward to seeing him uh, at the gathering. Awesome. Is, is Chuck officially retired then? He's just going to kind of do the autograph sessions now, is he? I assume he's not going to be wrestling and being a police officer. Yeah, uh, probably. Probably not really allowed. You know, you know, that's a, definitely a company that gets hurt. But also in Vegas, it's very like where I live. I live in New York. There's so many independent shows going around. And I'm a drive. New York, New Jersey, you know, Boston, you know, Pennsylvania. There's so many shows. I'm, I'm an hour and a half, two hours, three hours. And there's so many shows out there where, you know, I get a lot of work. It's very hard. You're going to use Chuck. You got to fly him in and stuff. Plus, with his schedule, it would it would definitely conflict. It's not like he could get in his car and drive an hour down the road knowing he's going to be off. You know, everything would be a flight because there's not much going on, you know, in Vegas that I know of anyway. You know, and I'm saying there's nobody running shows, but not enough to do it for a living or to let it deal with your job. That's my opinion. I don't know. It could be wrong. Yeah. Who do you keep in touch with, James, then these days, who you met over your story career? Like, who were your best friends that you made throughout the business? Most of them are, and I keep in touch. And I don't see them that, that, that often. Well, I do because I do a lot of independent shows. It's pretty much the guys that early ECW guys, uh, some guys from my wrestling school, well, not really mine, uh, Iron Mike Sharp, which was Ace Crowbar and Danny Doring and you know, um, all that crew, I would see Roadkill because Chris uh, Crowbar would always have parties at his house, and I don't get there as much as I would like. Um, so I still keep, you know, guys, I, of course, like I said about the indies, I see a lot of guys all over the shows. I just did a, a show last week. Um, Chris Masters was on it. I haven't saw Chris Masters in a long time. It's great seeing him. Tom Freeman was on. I get to see Tom a good amount of time because he works a lot of this area too. Um, and he was always one of my best friends in the business. He helped me out a lot in early, early ECW days. And, then, well, you know, all, all, always, you know, even in uh, the TNA days back in the 2010 when ECW was over and WWE was over. And then he started relaunching all this kind of stuff. So he had a lot to do with my career in many different ways, even now, you know. Um, but, one of uh, one of the uh, the fans on social media sent a question that that I actually uh, wondered as well, and that was: Have you back when um, we're we're talking the period of time that you were making your mark in ECW, and there and there there were a lot of feelers going out from uh, depending on on whoever you, you're listening to tell the story from WCW to Raid. Uh, ECW talent, were you ever part of the discussions uh, to come into WCW? Not not only during that that period of of time that they're talking about the raids that Todd Gordon speaks of, but but uh, just just any time during the the existence of that company. No, when uh, talking about when right before we closed down, I did ask. I believe it was Tom. It wasn't. Uh, I think Canyon was get doing that whole cruiserweight thing and he was getting all those guys and they were into that. It was, it was going and, you know, I didn't know what was going on with WWE exactly. So I think, I think it was actually Tommy Dreamer that I went to and I said, um, I said, uh, you know, cause T uh, Mama Luke used to, uh, Canyon and, and Mama Luke. And I think it was Jamie Noble. There was like four or five of the boys. They all had a big house cause they were all going to, you know, actually at that time they were like working in bars, but doing the wrestling too. Um, 
So that was when um, how was I talking about again? WCW coming in. Oh, so yeah, so I went to uh, Tom and and I thought ECW was was sinking. So I was just like Tom, you know, there might be an opportunity because of Mama Luke was going to call Canyon and say, hey, do you want to use us? You know, we, we were going to put the field out there. It wasn't like my phone was ringing off the hook and saying, hey, the FBI, let's go. No, that's no, that didn't happen. But and I had a lot of loyalty to ECW at that time. I had a lot of loyalty to, to Tom, of course, even Paul Lee, you know, Paul Lee let me work his merchandise office. So during the week, I used to work all week long for them. I got paid to work all week long and then I got paid on the weekend to do the shows. Guys like me, Dreamer, Devon, we used to work in the Westchester office in White Plains. We uh, mail out the T-shirts and, and, and bring the orders and pack the trucks so the T-shirts can get to the shows. And then we go wrestle on the shows. A lot of times, the shirt trucks. So I had a lot of loyalty to Dreamer and Paul. You know, so it's not like I, but like I said, they weren't knocking on my door, but I needed to make a move depending. So that's how my part went. But then next thing you know, everything just shut down. You, you, you touched on Paul there, Paul Heyman. What do you make of the longevity of his career and to where he is now, even as an on screen character still on WWE? What's your kind of memories of working with Paul? And are you surprised that he's still as heavily featured on WWE TV now as he? As he used to be yeah look, listen he deserves it i mean he, he's phenomenal you see him you know you know you know people could you know listen there's going to be people that like him and don't like him what he did for a lot of people including myself he did tremendous stuff you know some people may have got screwed by him then they have the right but you know I, he you know whatever happens happens he had a long career he owned the company you know everybody you know I, he was always good to me. I never had a problem with him. I'm always loyal to him. He gave me a job. And if it wasn't for him, he's the one that uh, when, when I came home from Puerto Rico, I went to to, uh, to Tommy and they told Tommy Dreamers to come down to uh, meet uh, Paul Lee, Lost Battalion Hall. And I remember I came down there and, and I, I introduced myself. And, you know, I introduced myself as Damian Stone because that was my name at the time. Now, I never really met Paul. I knew who he was. Uh, I was doing a lot of independents all over New York and stuff. But Paul knows what's going on. I guess at the time I didn't know that, and I, I introduced myself. The first words I was out, I'll never forget. Because I know who you are, you know. And I said, oh, you know, introduce, you know, blah blah blah. And then next thing you know, I started going to all the New York shows. He, he, he you know, told me to come, and I was wrestling on the shows as Damian Stone. And then uh, something happened one night, and then he's like, "You're a little, you're going to be." No, he kept saying to me as every week, and started booking me on all the shows, Boston and stuff like that. And he's like, you remind me of a Joe Pesci about the type of character, you know. You know but, uh, and he kept saying that, saying that. And one day I came in, he's like, you're going to be little Guido. Little Guido, you're like Joe Pesci, short, but fiery, pluggy, you want to get mad, blah, blah, blah. And that's how that all started. He put me with J.T. Smith. And then when WWE ended, you know, it took a couple of years, but he's the one that actually called me and told me that, oh, he was going to get me a job. It took two years after the close, you know, he, he you know, he, he when they did close, you know, I think he really tried for me. It was just hard. When ECW closed, the WCW closed, we all went on the market together with the Rob Van Dams, all the big t Booker T's, all the yeah. big. You know, they and then WCW, uh, WWE bought most of WWE contracts at that time. They didn't do that with ECW, so it was like all these guys. I had to wait, you know, to get shuffled in and out, and you know, they, because they were all bigger stars than me, especially at that time. ECW closed. I didn't have anything. So, you know, I did independence for a couple of years, you know, and I kept, again, we're going back to Paul because that's what you asked me about. And then again, you know, uh, uh, like I said, you know, me and Paul got close because ECW, you know, I I was I, I worked hand in hand with his mother and father at the time because they were part of the company. They, they were a lot of stuff, stuff was done through that, them. Um, and then he's the one that got my job with WWE, you know, he came up with the, the Nunzio character and presented it or whatever he did and then they took the fbi thing a little into it so you know i i have nothing uh, i'm not kissing his ass i have nothing bad to say about him what do you want me to say you know the guy, look what he did for me you know but i agree with some people that don't like him for whatever reason they have then and okay I, I get what they're saying you know but um you know he was, he was always good to me you know for all you know everybody says oh don't he owe you money for the total of three grand he owed me he got me a job making six figures in two different places for years yeah, I think I'll let the five grand fly. I think I'm okay with it. Yeah. In fact, it adds up to it, whatever it is. Because people are always under the assumption that we went two years without getting paid. Not the way it worked. We got paid. 
we got paid, got paid. Then all of a sudden you miss a week, and then got paid, then miss a week, then got paid, got paid, miss. It went like that for a few months, five months, six months. So yeah, so we were still getting money. It wasn't like oh he owes me, you know. And don't get me wrong, there are some guys that were, were plane tickets and stuff like that are a little more. That's a little bit of a different story. So everybody, everybody really has their own you know, own story to tell of how it affected them, you know. So. I can't speak for that. Speaking of of ECW, one of the the major uh, you know polarizing issues is the WWE reboot of the product, so to speak, about fifteen years ago or more now. Uh, when when this came to your attention and you saw that the the especially the first one night stand that that was from a guy that was uh, an original fan who actually saw the shows in Swanson and Rittner, I was impressed with that. I thought, you know, they're really going to do this, this right. And then, you know, the next year it was still, still an amazing show, blah, blah, blah. But then when you saw the way that, that Vince rolled out the, the TV product, a lot of, a lot of uh, individuals that I've had the pleasure to speak to thought that, you know, Vince, on purpose sabotage the ECW brand to kill it, so to speak, in terms of the love that all the fans have for it and obviously failed. Uh, to this day, there's there's a lot of us out there that uh, still appreciate it. But was that your interpretation too when you saw how it went down that this was an intentional sabotage or was it just part of the, the WWE machine and how they process pro wrestling? Again, I mean, I, I'm not, not going to say that he, he bought it so he could shit on it or sabotage it. Because I was there when when he bought it, I guess. No, well, I, I was there when he started the, 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 the revival because I was already working for them as Maguita, uh, as Nunzio. So I ended up going to their, their, their show. Uh, they ended up bringing a lot of my friends back, Danny Doring and Roadkill. So I was actually happy bringing all the boys back. You know, in the very beginning, they gave us, a, from what I believe, remember, a different arena ourselves to try to get it going and, and start. Yeah, we went when we went to the Hammerstein Ballroom, we were on fire. South Philadelphia on fire, but it ain't going to work in two places, you know. And when we would go into all these different other markets, we were only drawing a few thousand people. And, you know, and, and it was hard to make money because you get, you get paid, you get your guarantee, but you get paid by the gate. So... It wasn't working. Then they, they moved it into, we started doing it uh, um, during SmackDown. Uh, we were doing our own house shows, and then we were doing t t taping TV at like 10 o'clock at night on SmackDown, which was very hard to do, too. You know I mean? You're going out there. They start watching dark matches at 7. Here you're going live TV at 10. You know, and a lot of these people, they, you know, they're not even they're staying, so... You know, it just, I, I, you know, I don't think he meant to sabotage it. I think it didn't, it didn't work. I mean, listen, maybe he did. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. But I, to me, I mean, he always seemed like a businessman. Yeah, does he have any ego? Sure, he does. Well, you know, he, you know, he bought WCW, but at least he, 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 he made it an effort. Like he did an angle at us squashing it in a way. You know, he did it made it a storyline or whatever. You know, he didn't, he didn't just go out to sabotage it. Or maybe he did. I don't know, but. I don't think that he did that because I think if he could have made money with it, he would have. He's a businessman. That's what I was about to say. He's a bit. Why would he want to? You know, if it's if it's working on its own and you just got to put a little spice on it, maybe. Why? Why would you just say oh, I'm going to kill it? Because it's not like he walks around bragging. I killed ECW. I never heard him say that. You know. But I don't know. I'm not in his inner circle, so I don't know. Except when he won the title and was uh, was talking about killing ECW at that point, uh, did did that make you uh, raise an eyebrow when he put the belt on himself, or is that just part of the the deal? That's when he that he shaved his head, right? He had the bandana on his head and he had the belt. So you know, I look at it differently. You know, no, no, I, I I wasn't mad. I mean, does it surprise me? No, you know, it surprise me. Yeah. Now, now I think he's playing. Like anything, the way he plays his character, he plays it to a T, you know. And he knew, he knew everybody loved the, the ECW, so that by him saying he's going to kill it, he's an instant heel, you know. I, I think if it worked on its own and, and it could have beat him, he would have gave in and ran with it. 
but it didn't it didn't didn't it didn't mount them in anything where he's like i'm gonna take this and run it just didn't go any further now people say oh yeah that you know he had his uh you know oh you know he had take on it behind the scenes or whatever i don't know i was never in any of those meetings you know uh producers were always the same you know it wasn't like you know so which was great was it any time for all this didn't work what what do you think about some of the rumors that are online uh, about with with the regime change there triple h involved uh you know head of creative etc moving to netflix i keep seeing these posts not sure about you know the authenticity of same <laughs> that they're talking about uh starting ecw again on netflix and and having it be not uh, pg-13 again but having it more uh, akin to the original product. Do you, do you see that as working on that platform in 2025? I don't know. What else are they going to do that they don't see in WWE now? And it was different when we did it in 95 and then the WWE and the Attitude Era and everything. What else are they going to do? God forbid, you know, what are these guys going to do to each other? You know, so I don't know. Hey, you know what? I don't know. You know, they got, they, I didn't know they were going to do that. I thought they were moving that regular show. They're moving. They're going to make an ECW show, a brand new one. Well, well, there's there's rumors to that effect that that's part of the plan. And again, I, I'm not sure about the veracity of the rumors, but it's uh, it's something that's intriguing. But then the counter argument to that is, well, AEW does a lot of ECW style stuff already. So with all the blood and blah blah blah, so it's it's questionable whether. That's an actual bona fide rumor, or just something that's that's out there. Would you be interested? I know you've got a great career now. Would you be interested if somebody called you and said, uh, "We want to reboot the FBI, make you the uh, the mouthpiece or whatever"? Would you be interested in that? Well, they they have their whole Italian group down there now in NXT. Um, but um, yeah, listen, you're, you're never not interested, and uh, you know we actually started a new FBI too with Zach Clayton and. Um, Ray Jazz, you know, we did, uh, we're doing some, we did a couple Indies together and stuff. We did some stuff with TNA, you know, so trying to reboot with those guys too. I mean, it would be a good, uh, they, they would be a good fit, could be a easy storylines to do. So I would never say never, you know, I would have to work around my career, you know, it's hard to give that up, but I'm sure we could make that work, especially as a, 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 a mouthpiece, we could make things work. But no, you always listen, work is work. Why wouldn't I? Why would never say no? That'd be stupid of me. Yeah, but you, you, my- you, you touched on Vince McMahon there. Is there is there a moment that you remember working with him that he kind of gave you a solid piece of advice around your character or worked closely with you in any way? Well, he, he um, I mean, he worked closely with me because I uh, I did stuff with him with uh, on pay per view stuff like that. He hired the FBI to go chase Hogan around. I had a whole interaction with him in, in the ring you know uh, about this whole the hit thing if you could go look at it when we did the greatest hits and everything we did like a 15 minute pro. so um you know yeah he, he told me some stuff i mean that worked enough but he did a lot a lot of stuff with them where um you know on tv and during a match and run-ins where uh you know he critiqued me a little bit and told me basically he just told me the way he wanted me to do it for, for that you know it was different different type of critique and it wasn't like you watch one of my matches and told me something like that you know but uh promo wise because i did do a lot of promos and he actually put the ones that he wasn't even in vince if it depends who was in the promo and i did a lot of stuff with brock lesnar and all those guys because of the fbi so a lot of times you know even undertaker we did a sit down with him you know vince would was was uh, there he used it with a couple other people but he was there so i had a lot of time backstage with him you know, and then he, yeah, he gave me some good critique. I can't, got my head, I can't tell you something that he told me that, you know, you know, he liked my character and he let me do what I, you know, that I wanted to do. And I, I, that was it. I mean, I don't think I was a real top priority, you know, but it was working with our group. It wasn't like it was just me by myself. If I didn't have Chuck and Johnny, yeah, I wouldn't have fit in doing angles with Kurt Angle. I wouldn't fit in doing stuff with Brock Lesnar, The Undertaker, the APA. I was able to be involved in with those guys for two years as a manager, not even step in the ring. That gave me two years, and I, and and I, then we used to do six man tags, so it was great. And I got to work with 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 all those guys. I couldn't work with them without the other two, you know. So uh, put me working with Vince 
we work the storylines with Hogan, but we were that's a dream come true with a kid. And working all the time, making money. You had a, a, a great run in the WWE as uh, the, the cruiserweight uh, champion. How how was that uh, proposed to you? And do you have any, I mean, I could list some of the great matches that you had there, but what would you uh, regard as your, your standout uh, moment as that uh, as that champ? And, and advancing that that kind of work rate on the the WWE national stage that they're you know perhaps not as used to as in some other companies. Well, the first I, I won the cruiserweight title twice. I mean, the first time, honestly, which you probably don't even realize this. My little one. Right. Don't going on out there. My first run. The thing with my first run is, um, you know, they gave me the belt in Milan, Italy. I, we flew to do an overseas tour. So the first show uh, was Milan, so I did a house show. I beat, I won it in Rome, but then I lost it at the TV the following week, following Tuesday, uh, to Hoover Guerrero. So I never even brought the belt to the United States. They showed a clip of it on SmackDown. So that was a crawl, I would say. So that that was like, but that, it was nice winning it in Italy. I got a nice ovation and stuff like that. So I only had the belt like seven days. I never made it back to the United States with it. And the second one time I won it, it was um, Paul London. Uh, we won, I won it in Connecticut. And, uh, so they, they pushed it a lot. I, I was able, we were able to do SmackDown a good amount of time, but they really pushed it a lot uh, for Velocity. And they, at that time, was like, uh, they, you know, they weren't doing much with it, and they were like, they put it on Velocity. Then they brought it back to SmackDown because they put it on Hornswoggle. Then they started putting it on a girl. They, then it started to go away. You know, so uh, it went from with me, SmackDown. A couple other guys had it. You know, or, you know, we all had it. Me, Chavo, Scotty, Aki. You know, we always we passed it around for the long as we could, and then they kind of just made you know made a joke of it, and um, then then we died. You know, but you know, I mean, nobody had a great one. But for me, I th- I mean, I I enjoyed it. I had fun. I'm happy. I because I was cruiserweight champion. I held it for whatever three months, four months that second time. I was, I was. I had a lot of fun the first time. It made sense. I was in Italy. It was definitely a shock. You don't see, you know, guys winning on house shows titles. And then on the next mm-hmm. down, they showed a, a clip of uh, the, the end match, of, and then they they showed a match. Then we lost that night. We lost that. How, how did they pitch that to you, James? Um, or when did you find out you were going to win it in Italy at the house show? I, that night. Mm-hmm. That, and then the one just I went in there. They told me he was getting the belt. They didn't tell me I was losing. You know, seven days later, but it was cool. I held the belt all over the uh, European tour, and then went there, and they, uh, that was it. I was still happy. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't bad. Yeah, but it was. At least I had to fly back there. I, it was great. I didn't have to bring it here or take it home. Thing weighs like thirty pounds. <laughs> Very, very true. One of the uh, the fans who was actually here uh, in Smith Falls last year when you came in for Great North Wrestling and you wrestled twice, uh, commented on, you know, just what great, you know, physical condition you're in and, and how great your, your work rate still was, how great your matches were, uh, including against Harry Smith. That, that was probably my favorite on on the show that I booked. So, wanted to want to ask you with with all the years and uh, shoot elements of your career, and and all the uh, the miles, the the bumps and the miles. How how have you managed to maintain, you know, such uh, literally haven't lost a step in the ring, and that's the fans' uh, assessment. But but also maintained your your conditioning so consistently when you see other people uh of of your era you know not have that that same experience yeah i mean a lot of it has to do with genetics you know i'm not gonna sit here and act like uh, i'm in three hours a day and stuff like that but uh you know i watch what i eat a few days a week i mean i'm a lot smaller i i lost, I lost weight from when i was with w 25 pounds heavier but you know when i was coming down you know when i was up there i was eating a lot more healthier food 
I cut down on eating a little bit because I no need. I'm not lifting as much, but I didn't get fat. So the stuff didn't turn to fat. I don't have real regimen right now. I have good muscle memory. That totally helps. So I go to the gym like three days a week. I do circuit training. Uh, I do a little bit of cardio. And for the most part, I watch. I watch what I eat. You know, try to watch or do the best I could. You only you only could do so much. You know, I like I like to have bad calories sometimes. I like to have a few drinks. I use those shitty calories, but. You know, you got to do what you got to do. So, but you know, I, I have nothing, you know, I don't make it sound like I do my cardio, I lift weights, I watch what I eat, and muscle memory has a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, I want to look good. I'm still going out there, but I've lost a step. I definitely, you know, because, you know, from the outside, I got, I do have, you know, bad knees and stuff. I got to be careful running the ropes and certain things. So, you know, some, there's a lot of stuff that you don't see. How did you manage to avoid uh, some significant, uh, un- unless that's that's unknown to uh, the public, some really significant uh, injuries, especially, you know, when you were working a full-time schedule and, and for ECW, it seems like uh, you were blessed in that regard? No, I definitely wasn't blessed. I, I got hurt a lot, especially going through the tables and stuff. But like everybody would tell you, word, you didn't even realize it. It's unbelievable how the way you could feel in the morning with your back and not turn, you know, not be able to walk. And then by the time you have to go to that ring, you go out there and do the things that you would do. And 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 people don't believe it. And I can't believe it sometimes the way you work through injuries. You know, and that's that's what you did. You, you know, sprained your ankle. A lot of people came and walked to the refrigerator. We're taping that shit up. We're going out there. And, yeah, we're babying as much as we could. There's no babying going on. You know, you're babying as much as you could. So. You know, I mean, I broke my jaw wrestling, and you know, there's certain things that I had to stop when I, you know, certain injuries you have to. And I tell you the truth, I think it's a lot safer now. Yeah, now they got the, the doctors. And don't get me wrong, we had a nice medical staff when I was there, but I mean, it's upgraded ten times since I've been there. You know, they're in 2024. I still see Larry Heck there and stuff, but I'm just saying the system, the programs that they have. You know, it's great. And then, you know, if a guy gets hurt, it's great that they get, they don't have to work and, you know, at least they can still support themselves and take care of themselves. You know, back then we just worked. It was just well, mostly. So, you know, I do the best I can, you know, there's no miracle. I'm not, I don't do anything crazy to look like this. I think James might be frozen there. Oh, no, he's back. <clears throat> Uh, I'll throw out a, ra- a random name that you worked with, uh, James, if you have any memories. Uh, when Nathan Jones came into WWE, what was he like to work with? And a lot of the, the talk with it, that he wasn't quite ready for what they had planned for him. Yeah, no. I, uh, I mean, I always liked Nathan. Nathan was always cool. I went out to breakfast a couple of times in a hotel with him and stuff like that. And I worked a lot with him. He was on our hit list. I worked against him. I did that stuff on WrestleMania. I think 19, I stole his wallet. We did a little something leading into some shows and shit like that. Um, you know, I thought he was all right. I don't think he just got... And it's funny because I just saw him in a few movies, you know, over the past couple of years. Um, I always liked him. This, this business wasn't for him. This just wasn't for him. I was on a plane, I think, when he quit. We drew, flew to Australia, and uh, we had some bad turbulence. We had bad weather or whatever, and then uh, he got off because Chuck Palumbo was supposed to wrestle him. It was Nathan Jones, and Nathan Jones quit. He never came. He flew, took the flight to Australia, and then never came to the show. So he kind of, he was just pretty much done with it, I think. I think he was just done with it. Um, but yeah, I, Nathan, I thought it was cool. And I, I think, you know what, it, it, I think he's made for what he's doing. He's an actor. You know, some people can't do this. You know? and I, did I think he was horrible? No, because I did shit with him, too. So no, but no, but, if, you know, for what WWE wanted out of him, I don't think that that he was, you know, going to do it. And I don't think after WWE was going to do it, he was smart to go try to find the movies. You know, what else are you going to do? Not out there to make a living. So I think he did the best best thing for him. Uh, any any memories of the Undertaker? We hear all the time that he kind of was the guy who kept the the locker room together. Did you have that kind of experience with him outside the ring? Oh uh, yeah, well yeah. I never, you know, I never really caused trouble. So I would like thank God when they did the wrestlers court. I was always uh, sitting in the crowd watching, saying, "God damn, I hope that's not me next time." So I, <laughs> I always on this straight and narrow. But I was there with JBL. I think it was him. He was the sentence guy. They had to give him the liquor. I forgot. I don't think that. Well, they don't have that anymore. Um, but no, I, I never like really, uh, uh, you know, fucked up that bad. You know, you know, I mean, guys like the Undertaker, the good 
happens like when we go overseas and stuff because after the shows we all hang out at the hotel bar together drink and stuff and and I had a good relationship with those guys. I like to have a few. I never acted stupid. I never threw up. I'm not yelling and screaming. Uh, but then, you know, after the regular shows, when you're in the States, you never, you know, they go their way. We go our way and stuff. So, no, but yeah, no, he, he was the, the, the guy at the time. He was the locker room leader and uh, still is. Even though he's not there, but every time he walks in, he will be. Were you surprised when uh, you know you were there in ECW during that that time frame? And a lot of fans uh, ask about uh, ECW uh, originals when that that deal with uh, the Nashville Network TNN came together, and there there was hopes for the company to go to that that next level and uh, you know really break break through and become uh, a strong number maybe number two, uh, national company. Were you surprised when uh, things went south there during that time? And the fan also wanted to know about your matches with uh, another incredible performer, Super Crazy. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, when, when TNA deal came through, oh, you know, I, we all thought, okay, here we are. This is what we needed. We struggled to pay 97. You know, momentum. You know, we had paper, other pay-per-views, and we needed to, to get on a network. We couldn't do it anymore on MSG and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so when that happened, we're like, all right, we could go be worse. TNN, we're on TNN, 8 o'clock. What, what was it, Friday nights? We thought it was going to be great. And within eight months, I see Paulie going, fuck you, network. You want to air this shit? I'm like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I'm like, is that work? Is he fighting the network for real? Nobody knew, though. Nobody knew behind closed doors if it was an angle or not. We, I thought it was not, I thought it was an angle. I'm like, he can't be yelling at that network like this. And why? Because it's up to them to put it on. And they put it on. So I didn't, I didn't know what the hell was going on. That, that, that I guess, obviously, it was real, you know. So, yeah, so that kind of went, that kind of went to, uh, that kind of went to shit. I've been around a lot of things that went to shit. At least I was around for them. What about, what about, uh, uh, as as I touched on just a second ago, you're, uh, during this time frame, some of the highlights of that uh, ECW on TNN were those matches that you had with uh, Super Crazy, who's actually still active as well. Do you have, do you have any uh, standout um, moments from matches with him that you can recall off the top of your head? Uh, I, honestly, I had so many matches with him between ECW and then even in WWE. Uh, and him into Jerry, you know, but the good thing, but one thing about him is he became a very good friend. I just saw him not too long ago. I saw him, uh, him into Jerry. I just saw them. They both became very close to me when they started, you know, Rob Feinstein used to bring them around. This is when they were very young coming from Japan. This is in 96, 97. And this is when they started putting us together. They would come my way. Uh, we would hang out in my area. They, they, get, they would have hotels by us. We would go drinking. This is like 96, 97. And I became very good friends with them. We not only became wrestling in the ring, we became very good friends on the outside. And I think that helped us in the ring, you know. And, and um, so, you know, Super Crazy and Tajiri, they became, we became very good friends with those guys. And I mean, we had so many matches all over, one night stand, you know. We had, uh, you know, if you just watch all the pay-per-views. And sometimes I go online when I'm, I'm bored, I'll go on, I'll put one of our matches and a bunch come up and I'll just pick different ones. Because sometimes I figure you forget them one. Then you'll remember, ah, oh, man, I remember that. But then you'll do shit that you don't remember doing, obviously. You can't remember the whole It's not like I watched that match. I'm like, oh, I remember wrestling there. It's like the other day I watched the one with, uh, with me, Mikey, Simon Dean, and somebody else in Milwaukee, and the lights went out. They lost electricity in the building, and we were in the rave. And I just watched out there, and I'm watching the match. I'm like, this is the one where the lights are going to go out. I, I, could just, I know it, I know it. And they went out, you know, so certain shit like that. Actually, you, you mentioned to Jerry, he actually wrestled in Ireland a couple of months ago over here for OTT. Like, you know, he's he's still going strong. Um, but if, if, if you were to um, pick a moment from your career, that's like your standout moment for whatever reason, whether it be titles or personal relationships, whatever, what would that moment be? I would say it would be, uh, you know, just being part of the match. It wasn't me. There was nine of us in the match. But it would be, uh, you know, I wrestled at Madison Square Garden, you know, many times, many times. But 
when we did WrestleMania 20 at Madison Square Garden, my father brought me to the first one. I was at WrestleMania 1, uh, then they had WrestleMania 10, then they had 20 at the Garden. So me being a kid in the stands at WrestleMania 1, whoever knew 20 years later, I was wrestling in Madison Square Garden. Now, I wrestled there before WrestleMania 20, but and that was still great my first time ever there because I'm like, wow, this is great. But being it was WrestleMania and my parents were there, we had them up in the, the skybox with the rest of all the parents and they had catering for them. And, you know, it's definitely a great moment. Yes, yeah, so my, my involvement, all our involvements in the match were like a minute and a half each, like a nine man gauntlet. You know, so what am I saying? It was my highlight match? Uh, no. But, you know, as far as one of my highlights of career, we didn't, I didn't win. That didn't make a difference. It was just whoever knew 20 years later that would be wrestling with Madison Square Garden in, in WrestleMania 20. Being there for the first one. A lot of us were there for the first one. Dreamer was there. Uh, this was before I knew him. Uh, Bubba Ray Dudley was there. I think Cactus Jack was there. They were also there for the Morocco thing. No, I think it was the Morocco thing I'm talking about. I was there for both. In, in terms of uh, a name that, that comes up a lot uh, with respect to uh, the original ECW and, and your um, interactions uh, with him or uh, be it in or outside the ring, a lot of the fans uh, want to know about your experience working with uh, New Jack, Jerome Young. You know, I, I, I've run about uh, at the ECW arena, me, I was, I was friends, very good friends with New Jack. He hung out. I, I, I was trying with Tommy Rich, Tracy Smothers, Sandman, um, Tommy Rogers. We had a van that we were traveling and, and New Jack would travel with us. He, I was with that guy every weekend. He was definitely out of his mind. He, I, and, and I would, there's times I would be like, oh my God, I watched him fight a million times. I've been out with him a million times. And sometimes, you know what? I'm not going to say he gets the bad end of the stick I, at all. But sometimes he gets attacked and people, like, nudge him sometimes. And then sometimes he just, he's just going to go off on you, you know. And I'm talking about strangers, too, you know. So, um, But he was always crazy. He always got to never stiff me in the ring. I have had numerous matches with him. And all my matches consist of him hitting me with objects. And he never, <laughs> never stiffed me. Yeah, did I feel the party getting in that? Yeah. But he could put it with the point on. There's many different ways you know guys are taking care of you. And don't get me wrong. I mean, this shit happened with uh, Vic Grimes. I'm just like, it's just fucking, that That was crazy. And even, you know, with the, with his revenge on him with the stunner and throwing him with the sting gun. You know, I mean, I think that's I think that's totally crazy. I mean, any normal person, you know, I mean, I mean, God forbid that, that, that Vic Grimes, this guy would have been, you know, uh, dead. You got to be, you got to be careful too, you know. Poor Vic could have died, you know. But yeah, I understand he did that. But what happened at in Danbury? That was the whole incident that led up to to all that stuff, you know. So there was beef there, and if you know, I mean, if you if you fucked with him, you know, he's gonna try to fight you. So you either fight back, you know. And I I've, I've seen guys fight back on him, where you know it wasn't like I just watch him beat all these people up. I mean, I'm talking about outside stuff. I saw people get licks in, and we break it up and stuff, you know. And not saying they beat him up, but it wasn't like you just beat them up, you know. New Jack is no, without a doubt, a tough guy. You know, if, he, if he's not winning with his hands and there's something around, he's going to use that. You know, and, and if, if he has a knife on him, he's going to use that. If he has a gun on him, he's going to use that. He, he's done it. I've seen him do it. You know, well, not anymore. God bless him. Yeah. Were you Were you surprised that he that he passed uh, so so young? Say that again. Were Were you surprised uh, that he passed? so young just you know as he was starting to with the dark side of the ring uh get that uh more mainstream recognition or or, or was that something that given his lifestyle etc that that wasn't a, a a total i mean it's a shock when anybody dies but was that something that you could foresee No, well, you know, like, listen, honestly, if you, uh, no, when we see one of the guys I'm saying, I'm surprised that they, uh, no, he was, he, he was a crazy guy, you know, he did a lot of things, you know, but, you know, he just, you know, I don't know, you know, he, he was always nuts, you know, so, uh, no, it doesn't surprise me, you know, I'm not happy about it, it's not like, you know, you know, I didn't think it was going to happen, like, right now, but, you know, what? you know, he, he, he's a nutty guy, you know, he's crazy, you know, so, 
they just, yeah, it surprised me at the time. I'm like, oh shit, are you really, are you kidding me? The guy died, well, you know, yeah. yeah. I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm not surprised. You know, it's, it's not, as you said, then you think about it and you think of all the times that, you know, you hung out with him all the time, you partying and, you know, I mean, there's so much video. It's not like I'm telling on him. You see him high, high as a kite in the video with doing coke up for days. He's telling you, he's like, I'm not telling on him. I've watched him do videos, and you just—I know him personally, so I could see he's all strung. And I'm like, man, it can't—it can't be good for you, you know. It just can't be good for you, and in a long time for many years, you know. So, you know, that definitely sucks, 100. percent Especially, you know, I was friends with him. I was able to get close with him because of our clique. We were all—we all hung out together, you know. And we all did crazy things together. I'm no no angel, believe me. I done—I uh, done my share. I done. <laughs> I'm just not as crazy as him, you know. We we hear a lot of stories these days, and a lot of them are kind of negative towards fans, and I don't agree with it, like approaching wrestlers in public when they're going for flights with autographs and things like that. Did you ever kind of experience any funny or strange scenarios with fans over the years and traveling from shows like no, well, they're always in the airports because they know you. You, they know you're in the coming. They know where you're flying. They're always, so always when you go to baggage claim, they're always there. Uh, you know, I never, you know, and I know recently. I think there's a lot more of, uh, uh, of you know, of people saying leave them alone or whatever they're doing. You know, yeah, listen, I, I, I don't like the ones that are handing me a book with nine different slips in it that you're signing when there's ten other people waiting. You know, there's got to come to an end, especially when you're trying to get to your your, your car and stuff. Um, you know, I mean, they once we all come down, a lot of times is once you, you come out with the group. You know, these these guys scatter all around, so you know you get a few in, you get a few, and I, I never really turn any down, but I'll do all the ones around me, and you keep walking because once they're with other people, they're trying to get other autographs. Come down by yourself because there could be thirty people waiting for whoever's coming out there, and you're the only one. They're all gonna come up to you, you know. And it's not like it, it happened that much where I had, I had a problem. But it, you know, it's just it's part of the job. But, yeah, you know, I can see when you're walking everywhere you go, whether it's on the job, off the job, walking anywhere, and you got tons of people coming up to you, that, that would that definitely going to suck. That, that's what it is. But, you know, if I get to the bottom of the airport and a few people there, it doesn't bother me. Well, James, you've been uh, extremely uh, generous with with your your time tonight. Very much appreciated. Can you let the fans know where they can find you on uh, any of the uh, social media platforms? And and aside from the gathering that you touched on, do you have any other uh, events that uh, the fans should know about so that they can have the pleasure of interacting with you? Well, I'm on Instagram and, um, and uh, X. Uh, I think it's Nunzio under slash Guido. Or go to Guido under slash Nunzio. One, one, you go. Once you do Nunzio, you'll see it. I don't have the blue star next to it, but you'll see it'll be all my stuff being posted with wrestling. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody else that may have uh, may have that. I didn't invest in the blue star. Um, so um, that's where I am on uh, social media. And then, um, no, I got, I got the gathering coming up. I got something coming up in the Carolinas this weekend. I want to say Virginia. We're going to, it's in somewhere in Virginia. I don't, you know what? I don't have the, the information I would like I would like to say. But I am going to post it. I'm going to have the guy send to me. So if you go on my Instagram, Guido under slash Nunzio, uh, Nunzio under slash Guido, whatever it is, uh, you'll see something. I got to reach out. I got to post something about it. Well, we'll encourage all of the fans to follow you on social media. And, and uh, I, I can speak from... Uh, professional experience uh, booking you if there's uh, if you're interested and there's other promoters out there the man is a, a consummate professional and a pleasure to work with and we really appreciate your time here on the podcast tonight sir thank you for having me I appreciate it you guys have a good so. one. we'll give you one of these <laughs> have a good one guys Thanks, Thanks, man. That's it for this edition of the Cheap Heat Productions Pro Wrestling Podcast. I know, Morris, that uh, we've we've had some busy weeks and months and uh, are looking to uh, get back on track with many more of these uh, quality 
interviews uh, that that the channel's known for. Do you, do you have uh, anything uh, happening that uh, that the the fans of the channel who should be subscribed already uh, and liking the videos that they should know about? So we are back tomorrow with one I'm really looking forward to. So Jimmy Noonan, ex WWE head of security, who's now a, an actor. And he used to do some uh, work with famous bodybuilders in the 80s as well. So he's coming on. I've seen a couple of his interviews. Very interesting guy. Worked as head of security with all the top dogs in his time in WWE. So, And he's also not shy. So he's going to be telling some good stories with us tomorrow night. That's at 5 Eastern, 10 Irish. So we're going to get back on the saddle. And uh, still working on a few things. But we just need to get over the line on a few of them. Well, yeah. And... Uh just just in terms of uh nunzio uh, what what a uh what strikes me about about him and and again i i had him up for great north wrestling last year is the the man has had a, a phenomenal career uh really made his mark but uh in, incredibly personable incredibly down to earth and no uh, ego yeah, no, no ego, and uh, just just the type of uh, if you're a promoter out there, uh, very reasonable, uh, a guy that you're 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 gonna. He put on uh, honestly. I was Harry Smith, uh, British Bulldog Junior. Last uh, year at Smith Falls, I mean he's a, he's a phenomenon. He's he's a a beast. Of, he's he's uh, another he's people. another one we need to get on the show for sure. Absolutely, I mean just just a. a an absolute uh, prime of his career. And uh, I, I met what I said there, aside from uh, Magna McLaren of the big money players winning the Canadian title from, um, from Jeremy Prophet, I would say that his match uh, with uh, Guido